Now, when I, I moved into animation, I never expected to, to end up in management. I thought I would end up being an artist for my whole life. So, managing was something I kind of fell into. And I found out that actually managing is quite hard. It's as difficult to master as it was for me to learn how to draw. And most people, when they become supervisors, don't have any training. My experience was that one day I was an artist, and the next day I was a supervisor. And in between, there was absolutely no training that went on. And that happens, I think, with most companies, that they just assume that somehow, when you are promoted into a supervisory or management position, that you have been given this magic wand and bingo, you're going to become a good leader and a good manager. And that's, that's absurd. When I worked at Filmation on He-Man, we used to joke amongst all the storyboard artists that, the, that those amongst us, one of us one day would be anointed as the supervisor of storyboard, or they would be given a magic wand and bingo, they would know everything there is to know about supervising, and now they could go and change everybody else's boards. In fact, uh, we had made this He-Man cookout book, which was a gag bunch of drawings, and essentially a lot of the drawings were based on the idea that whoever became the supervisor uh, suddenly knew everything and could change the work of everybody else, when maybe three days earlier they might have just been an artist like the rest of us. Years later, I went to London. I was hired by Steven Spielberg to, to help uh, set up his studio with Cindy Woodburn at Amblimation. And at that point, I was the associate producer. And now I was in charge of a great many people, probably 200 artists. And at that point, I realized I knew absolutely nothing about management. And so I began this five-year journey of self-discovery for myself where I had to go and buy lots of management books to try to learn how to do what, uh, what I should already know how to do. And I would say without uh, any hesitation that I probably made every single mistake possible as a manager. And to uh, anybody who might be listening who had to suffer through those years of me, I apologize profusely. I remember when DreamWorks got started, Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, had all these grand plans of what DreamWorks was going to be. And David Geffen, his partner, uh, Jeffrey said, used to say to him, Jeffrey, there's God's plans and your plans, and your plans don't count. Well, that's kind of the way it is when you're a supervisor, except there's their needs, the needs of the crew, and they're your needs, and your needs don't count. Because that's the big transition you need to make when you move as an artist or in, into any kind of a support role into one of supervising. Is that at that point, your needs don't matter anymore. It's now the mat Now your job is maybe before you might have been a terrific animator or artist or whatever you were in some capacity. But the minute you become a supervisor, your actual productivity doesn't matter that much. What does matter is the productivity of all the people who work for you. And that's why I say there's your needs and their needs and your needs don't count. It's all about getting them to do their job and that's how you're going to be measured. And a lot of people who move into supervisory positions don't understand that. They haven't made that transition yet. That's the thing that nobody tells you when you become a supervisor. It's like now what you want doesn't matter. It's all about them. A little while ago, I went to a documentary on Joan Rivers, and Joan Rivers was in attendance. And in the documentary, there's a scene where Joan Rivers takes her show to the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland. And it meets with a great success, and so she decides to take it to the West End in London with the idea that if it does well in the West End, then she'll take the show to Broadway. Well, she gets mixed reviews from the show, and she decides that she doesn't get a big enough consensus from the, from the critics, and so she decides that she won't take the show to Broadway. Anyway, after the documentary, Joan Rivers was there, and one of the guys in the audience said, why did you let a handful of critics decide whether or not you go to Broadway? 
And Joan Rivers said, if the critics don't love you, then you don't have a platform and you're dead in the water. And what Joan Rivers was really saying, and this is a woman with almost 50 years, maybe more than 50 years of experience as a com comedian at the top of her field, what she's saying is, you got to have the support of others in order for her to take the show to Broadway. And the same thing is true with a good leader. You got to have the support of your team and you're just not going to be able to make it happen. Now, one time I worked on a project where it was struggling. It wasn't doing well at all. And the worse shape the project got, the darker the tan got of the guy who was in charge. And when the thing was completely running off the rails, the guy looked like George Hamilton. He couldn't have been Tanner and looked completely relaxed. And what that taught me was none of us on this show had any respect for this person because it's like, what are you doing at the beach when we're out of control? And eventually uh, it didn't come to a happy ending, the, the, the project. But the lesson I learned was you might have the business cards that say you're a leader, that you've got the job, but until you're ratified in the hearts and souls of the people that you work with, then you're not a leader. Now, leadership is most importantly you are in service to others. And this guy didn't get that. And one of the main things of being a leader is you got to be visible, you got to be there. And uh, I remember when I first got into managing an uh, associate producer in Amblimation, I was reading every business book I could get my hand on, I, hands on. I found the, the, the uh, Tom Peters book, In Search of Excellence, and in it he talks about MBWA, which is managing by walking around. And I think he hits on an incredibly important aspect of leadership, is you got to be there and you got to keep in contact with the people you work with. Now, I've worked at DreamWorks now for 15 years, uh, since the very beginning. And I can tell you, nobody is more visible and more approachable than Jeffrey Katzenberg. If you write him an email, I guarantee he will respond faster than anybody else in the studio. And he's got all these things to work on, and yet he somehow manages to respond to email. He answers every single phone call, and he'll actually have breakfast meetings with his animators because they're important to him. He's a great leader and he's constantly visible in the studio. So let me tell you some good things leaders do. The best thing leaders do is they unite the crew and they understand most importantly that they are on call all the time. Some years ago on Prince of Egypt we were recording on a Sunday in Toronto with Martin Short and Steve Martin and at the end of the session we were leaving the studio and in the lobby, there was a young man who was the guard for the day, and he had a banjo up against the wall. And as we were leaving, Steve Martin noticed the banjo, and he said, is that yours? And the kid lit up, was beaming, he says, yes, that's mine. And Steve Martin said, do you mind if I play it? And the kid couldn't have been happier. He said, certainly. So Steve Martin takes it out, and right there in the lobby does this impromptu banjo recital. And if, uh, if you know anything about Steve Martin, you know he's extremely talented at the banjo. He started out his career, in fact, working at the Glen Campbell show as one of the guys who stood up at the beginning of the show playing the banjo. So he's really good. And so the, that young guy in the, in the lobby and I, we were delighted to get to see this. So at the end of the, the thing, he says, that's a really nice banjo. And he starts handing it back to the young guy, and he says, would you mind signing it for me? And Steve Martin says, sure. And so he does. He signs the banjo to the guy. The guy closes it down, and he puts it away. Now, here's where the good leadership is. I have no doubt that Steve Martin knew as we were walking through the lobby and he saw that banjo, that he knew that that guy brought that banjo to that, to that day in the hopes that Steve Martin would sign it. But instead of Steve Martin waiting for the guy to ask him and go through that, he actually stepped in and encouraged the guy, a dialogue with the guy. Now, I guarantee that that guy showed that banjo to everyone he could imagine.
Everyone he met, he's going to tell that story to. And I'll bet he has that banjo today, even though it was probably 12 years ago. And the point of that is, Steve Martin, as a great leader and someone who's been in the uh, movie business and entertainment business for decades, didn't miss an opportunity to react and interact with his constituency. He knew that guy's important to him. Nobody else was going to see that event except me and that guy. And yet Steve Martin thought it was important enough to do. That's why Steve Martin is so successful. Because he doesn't let opportunities dissipate and he cares about people.